what success looks like. Welcome to the show where we talk about inspiring you to achieve impossible dreams. This is not a survivor and nobody's going to be voted off, but today we're going to be talking to the chief of a tribe, tribe riders, that is Jeff Goins. Jeff, how are you doing today? Hey, Robert. Good to be with you. Awesome. Awesome. It's good to uh, finally connect. I've been following your blog, following your site for a little while, and I've heard a lot of the good things or seen a lot of the good things that have been said about you and the, the, the path that you've taken. Michael Hyatt, a lot of people speak about him, and he's done the foreword for your book, Wrecked. Let's, uh, let's hear a little bit about your book. Tell me about the concept of Wrecked and where that came from. Sure, yeah. Well, so um, for the past six and a half years, I've worked for a nonprofit organization, and we uh, send people on uh, mission trips and, and service projects, and uh, we realized that when people went on some sort of counter, you know, cross-cultural experience and were immersed into a different culture, uh, something that is uncomfortable for a lot of people, and were exposed to, you know, uh, the, the needs of the, the poor and exposed to things like disease and, um, you know, uncomfortable things. They would come back from those experiences and they would say, man, I can't go back to the way I've, you know, the old way of looking at life. I'm wrecked. Right. We kept hearing this term over and over again. And so, um, you know, I had a thought, what if this is actually the way that we find our purpose in life, not by putting together a neatly packaged plan, but by letting the needs of the world uh, brush up or slam into uh, our comfortable lives, and uh, and so wrecked is is some of my story. It's a lot of other people's stories who are living intentional, purposeful lives. One of which is uh, Michael Hyatt, whom you mentioned. Yeah. And in each of these stories, there's a thread of a, a moment where somebody realized life is not just about me, and I am actually most fulfilled when I'm living for other people. And so we just explore that idea of uh, abundant living. Uh, may really have more to do with sacrifice and compassion than it does with uh, accumulation and uh, focus on self. Awesome, awesome. So I've I got the book recently and I haven't finished reading it yet, but it's very neatly and nicely written. Just love the style. And and I looked at the title for chapter five where it talked about going from wrecked to committed. Can you give me a quick synopsis of that chapter? Yeah. So I mean. When I describe what it means to be wrecked, um, you know, people from various backgrounds say that they've had an experience. Like they think, oh, well, you know, now that you've given me a name for it, I've I've experienced that. And maybe it was giving money to a homeless person, or uh, going on a mission trip with your church, uh, or or just you know, bringing cookies to your next door neighbor and and finding a way to help somebody in some way where you realize that you were changed through the transaction that by giving. Of yourself, you um, you know, you learn something about uh, your humanity, and so lots of people have that experience. But I don't think it's enough to just have you know one or two or a bunch of experiences. I think that we are all called to live uh, meaningful, service-filled lives by um, committing to something. So I think you know, wrecked is the beginning. You have an experience, but that needs to lead to some sort of commitment if it's going to turn into a lifestyle. In other words, your life isn't about you until it's a habit. Or I'm sorry, your life is not about other people until it, you know, it becomes right. a, a habit that you're actively practicing. Right, right. So I, uh, one of the things that I was excited about talking to you about, which we started to mention just before we went live here, was the fact that you had this dream of becoming a writer and I think you told the story where you told somebody that you wanted to write or become a writer and they must have asked you are you writing <laughs> or or something of that nature maybe you tell the story better than I do retell that for me sure well so one of the things that I did uh, over a, a, I guess about two years ago now is I um, joined a personal coaching group which I'd never done before um, and one of the members in that group asked me what my dream was. And I was right. starting to get annoyed by this question because lots of people had been asking me it. And I didn't like the idea of dreams. I thought that was childish and immature. And I thought, you know, I have a job and um, I, I, you know, make good enough money to support my family. Uh, why do I need a dream? You know, that seems like kid stuff. 
Right. And so I told him, I don't really have one of those. And he <laughs> said, he said, uh, are you sure? Because I would have thought that your dream was to be a writer. And when he said that, I mean, I, I was, something hit me, you know, something hit me in my spirit and I realized, wow, this is, this is true. And I was really afraid to admit that. And so kind of hesitantly, I said, yeah, I guess so. One day, maybe, I'd like to be a writer or whatever. And he said, oh, Jeff, you don't have to want to be a writer. You are a writer. You just need to write. Right. Awesome. Awesome. So now you are at the place where that day job is is no more. And, and I'm amazed by the fact that you just mentioned the number two years. Tell us about the, the that journey or that experience. So you, you, you had this epiphany or somebody brought you to this epiphany that you wanted to be a writer. Your dream was to be a writer. So how did you go from the, J, the day job to doing this full time? Yeah, so um, one of the reasons I didn't like the idea of dreaming and dreamers is because a lot of the dreamers that I knew weren't doers, and I had always uh, you know, been more fond of doing than, than dreaming in life, um, seemed to you know, yield better results. And so um, after I had that conversation, I started writing. I mean, I was writing you know, a little bit um, you know, whenever I felt inspired, but after that conversation, I started writing every day. And, uh, you know, I read Stephen Pressfield's The War of Art, and I realized what I need to do is get up every day and put my butt in the chair and just show up and right. let the words come, force the words come, do whatever I need to do, but I need to show up instead of waiting for the right opportunity. And so I started writing. I, I started a blog, and um, I, I thought that was it. Like, I thought, you know, I didn't think I could do this professionally because all the writers I knew weren't making any money. Right. Uh, and I wanted to support my family, and so I thought, uh, this is just a hobby. Maybe in a few years, probably five years from now, I might be able to write a book or something. But in the meantime, like I'm just satisfied knowing that I get to write and share my words uh, with people. And so that first year when things started to take off and I got a book contract offered uh, within six months of starting the blog. Wow. And uh, the following year, you know, released another ebook. That um, you know, over the course of a few months, uh, made us enough income that my wife was able to stay home and raise our son, um, which we had just had last year. Uh, and then I, I put together an online course that allowed me to be able to quit my job. I mean, all these things happened uh, very quickly. Um, I was really surprised by that because I thought, really, um, it would be enough for me to just be able to get up every day and and share some of my art with the world, but it's been a, it's been a really cool um, experience so far. Right. So some people just kind of hearing you tell that story, it almost makes it seem like, wow, you just woke up one morning, you said, hey, dude, I'm going to get a blog together. Then six months later, you had a book deal. And here you are two years later, you're able to quit your job and go into uh, your full time dream. Are, what, what are some of the challenges or what were some of the things that you're not telling us that you had to go through in order to really make this thing real, come to life? That's a great question. Um, and I think that what, I mean, I think the answer to that question is what you see when you see somebody succeed or achieve a dream, I've learned from my perspective, is not all there is to see. You know, like you're seeing what's you know above the surface but all this other activity has been happening below um and uh so you know something that i don't talk about very often robert because people look at this two years of kind of rapid growth and and they go hey that's that's great but it almost seems impossible to right. replicate right. what i don't get to talk about a lot is you know the five years of me trying to blog on you know 10 different websites and failing at all of them and uh you know, writing articles for magazines and getting turned down or once in a while getting published uh, by a magazine and then, you know, six months later having to reintroduce myself to that same, uh, you know, same editor or same magazine because they'd forgotten who I was because I wasn't anybody. And so, you know, going through all of this rejection and frustration and watching other people do things that I wanted to do and doing it much better and getting kind of you know, bitter and frustrated about that, I eventually decided that I wasn't doing any good, my, you know, much less myself, by being frustrated or bitter or looking at, 
you know, those hacks out there with blogs who's, you know, that I thought I was better than and realized I, you know, wasn't. Um, but realizing I could do better, I could do a better job. Um, eventually, I thought this isn't productive, you know, and what I need is a platform. I need, um, you know, a, a place where people can find me and, and build some sort of personal brand that allows, uh, you know, my voice and my personality to be memorable. Right. And, and so that's why I started over with blogging, and I realized pretty quickly that um, what I, when, I, when I thought I was trying before, I wasn't really trying. You know, I was doing the bare minimum and expecting the maximum results. And I think that those two words really uh, spell out, it, you know, defeat. I tried. Yeah. <laughs> Whenever I hear that, I really hear that as an excuse for, come on, give me a free one. You know, like, I tried. <laughs> let, you know, let, let, me, let me out of, of the consequences. And uh, I, you know, followed the advice of Yoda, who says there is no try, do or yes, do not. Exactly. And I decided to to do, and I think you know, those five years of really failing before um, starting it over, um, that was that was great practice, and it it allowed me to f you know figure out what I did want to do and what I didn't want to do. So. Yeah, I mean, yeah, things things took off more quickly than I thought they would, and part of it was because I had five years of failure beforehand and a year, you know, a lifetime of preparation um, where I had always dreamed of being a writer but had never really put my mind to it. And then I realized, you know, that I didn't – that year that I started my blog, I mean, I, I wrote every day. You know, I wrote over 300 posts for my blog. Wow. Um, and then I wrote another 100 or so posts for other blogs. So I wrote – I averaged more than one – blog post or article a day. So, um, you know, I knew that, that, the, that the internet is a noisy place and I had to work really, really hard to, um, you know, make my own dent in it. And I didn't, you know, other than my day job and hanging out with my family and eating and sleeping, I didn't have any other, other hobbies. I just, whenever I had a few minutes of time, I would write. Yeah. So you uh, t talk to me about what we were kind of – uh, processing just before we went live here. Uh, writers typically are not people that are money makers. And I, and I know when we talk about dreams here, money isn't really the primary focus, but we still have the reality of Mr. Bill knocking at the door. So how does a writer such as yourself follow their dream and still do enough to make it without having a full-time job? Yeah, I think this is this is an important topic, and I think when we get on the subject of dreams, we feel like we sort of have to apologize for the money making side of things because we have to like, well, it's not about the money, but the reality is like we all need money to live, right. and um, if your dream doesn't make you money, it's never the highest priority in your life, at least in terms of time, because most of us who have jobs spend most of each day at those jobs, you know? And I right. think that's a great thing. I think you know, if you have a job, you know, you're lucky because not everybody has one of those. Um, but if you, you should explore the, the possibility of, you know, maybe making some income off of your dream because for no other reason than it allows you to do it more. Right. You know? and, if, and if this was what you were made to do, uh, find a way to profit off of it so that you can do more of it. Um, so yeah, I mean, I didn't, I didn't go into this expecting to make money off of writing because I, because I wrote articles for magazines and I made, you know, $250 a pop off of those that, and they took me 20 hours to write. So, you know, that just doesn't scale. You know, I would never be able to support my family, um, you know, and actually live in a house that wasn't made of cardboard uh, <laughs> doing that. Yeah. So I just go, okay, this is for passion and I'm just going to right from the heart, I'm going to help out as many people as possible. Uh, but there's an interesting paradox. When you try to help as many people as you possibly can with your gift, whatever it is, uh, those people, some people have a way of wanting to compensate you for it. And, right. and that's what happened. You know, I gave away all kinds of free information on my blog, things that I had struggled with or were struggling with and tried to provide practical motivation or inspiration or solutions to those problems. And I found that people started asking me, literally, people started emailing me saying, can I do for something? Like, you're not charging for anything. You're not selling anything. Can, 
can I pay you for something? And enough people asked me that question that I decided, okay, I, I guess I better, you know, I guess I better let them. Right, right. So you have, um, you're talking about getting paid for your, your dream. And in your case, that is writing. And one of the things I'm sure that the people that are listening or watching want to hear about is how do I do that? How do I get paid for writing? And on your site, you've got something called tribe writers or, or developing a tribe. Tell me a little bit, tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah. So, um, the, the way I started making money online was, you know, basically accidentally where, where I was, I was helping people on my, my blog. And so I, then I took some of the, the ways that I was helping people and just kind of took it to the next level. And the first thing I did was sell an ebook and that did pretty well. And so the next thing I did was create an online course, uh, but which is tribe writers. And, um, basically that was just a response to a lot of emails that I got where people would ask me how I did what I did, where I, um, you know, built my audience. And so, um, I got so many questions and I, and I didn't have enough time to answer all of them. I, um, I started responding to people. I didn't come up with this idea on my own. I started responding to people saying, I don't know how, I, I don't know how to explain this to you. Like, just go read my blog. Um, I, I'd love to talk to you about this, but I don't have time to talk with all these people. And somebody emailed me and said, you should do an online course. I said, oh, really? Like, people, people like that sort of thing? Um, they'll pay money for that? I don't, I don't think so. And they go, no, no, they, you know, you should do this. It would help a lot of people. Um, so, so, over the course of about eight months, I slowly put together this course, um, first detailing my process of how I built um, an audience and then interviewing 12 experts who had, you know, built their audiences and either turned that into a business or turned that into a publishing career, you know, as I realized that the thing that you need um, as a writer is you need an audience. So if you want to get published, you want to make a million dollars, whatever your goal is, um, the answer is got to have an audience. And so I put together a course that helps writers understand how to use the internet to build an audience that helps them get to wherever they want to go. Okay. Okay. So I've been kind of holding on to this since you said this a while back. You mentioned the word platform, and that's a big Michael Hyatt buzzword. Tell sure. me a little bit about uh, some of your mentors and influences now that that are able to help you do what it is that you do yeah so you know Mike's a friend and have a lot of respect for what he does and he's got a uh, you know platform is a great book and he's got a, a great program called get published and a, a wonderful community called platform university all great stuff helping people build their audiences um, yeah so I've watched him for a long time and, and we both live in Nashville and so we we get to pretty regularly and just, you know, talk shop and learn from each other. Um, you know, in, a, in addition, I've got some virtual mentors um, in the writing and blogging and audience building world. A couple people that come to mind uh, are Seth Godin. I have a lot of respect for what he does. I've read almost everything that he's written. Um, right. He's always a challenging voice. Uh, Stephen Pressfield, is a, I mentioned him earlier, he really challenges me as a writer. You know, I, I think that one of the challenges as a, a blogger, as somebody who is not just uh, practicing your craft, but also sharing it and doing all the marketing for it, you can sometimes get lost in the promotion. And a lot of Steve's writing on his blog really helps me focus on what I need to be focusing on, which is the writing. So uh, those are a couple of people that I, I look to pretty regularly for inspiration. Okay, awesome. So I always like to switch gears a little bit and talk about technology because we've got social media as a big deal here yeah. and especially because you're blogging and you're writing online that is one way that you really get your message out so tell me a little bit about how you use social media or are there specific technologies that you use to really build your platform and and write sure yeah I mean technology is great it really enables all of this including this this talk um, yeah. I went to an event uh, many years ago, and at this event, these uh, is a technology event, which you know really intimidated me because I don't know anything about technology. And and there was this large, um, like, video screen, and on this screen were these things called tweets, which I just this was this was like five years ago, so this was a long time ago. 
Yeah. And I was like, what in the world is this? And like, I had like, you know, my flip cell phone and I, I like didn't understand how this worked and how I could like send a text message and it would like show up on this, you know, board of, you know, where this is Twitter hashtag. I didn't understand any of this, all these pound signs and stuff. Um, but it intrigued me so much that I had to figure it out. And I signed up for Twitter and spent, you know, many months not even knowing what I was doing, you know, where my messages were going. Um, but all that to say, uh, that's kind of my experience with technology in general is I'm looking at this and I guess there's something interesting about this, but I don't have the slightest clue exactly how this works, but I'm going to figure it out. And uh, I don't put a lot of stock in tools. I think that people spend too much time figuring out what, you know, what do you use to, what writing software do you use or what productivity manager do you, like everybody wants a tool and I think the reality is what we're looking for is a solution, and a tool never solves a problem. It right. just, um, you know, something that you can hold in your hand to maybe make the solution of the problem easier. But what really solves a problem is a strategy, the, the determination to figure it out. And so, um, yeah, I, I like Twitter. I, I'm on Facebook. I have a blog. Um, but the, the biggest piece of technology that I put the most value in is my email list. I get okay. the, the most personal responses from readers. And if I'm, if I'm selling something, which isn't, you know, which is occasionally, but not very often, uh, that's where I get the biggest response as well. And so from a business standpoint, as well as an impact standpoint, um, my email list is my most important part of, of engagement. I could lose my blog, Twitter, Facebook tomorrow, if I still have my email list, I would be fine both in terms of me feeling like I could communicate with people and also with, you know, sustaining the business side of it as well. Awesome. If you could recommend one thing to people in order to grow their email list, what would, what would that be? Give something away for free. <laughs> I, I, I know it sounds hokey and I thought it was like, like really people read these eBooks, but if you say free, Free blank when you sign up for my email list, people will sign up because people like free stuff and a lot of those people won't opt out because it's just an opportunity to show them that you have something of value to offer them. But if they do opt out, like that's cool, that's up to them. Uh, but you know, I have found that 90% of people won't. They'll stay engaged and so it is a great way to um, uh, one, be generous and two, um, connect with those people who care about you know, what you have to say. I remember, you know, trying to build an email list for six months and then I, and I got up to, I got my newsletter list up to 75 people. And then uh, in one week when I gave away a free ebook, when people often opted into my email list, uh, that, that number of 75 subscribers went to over a thousand. Wow. Yeah. Wow. yeah. It's really powerful. Okay. Okay. So we're going to wrap up with this one question here. Now you've accomplished your dream of being a full-time writer. Mm -hmm. So um, in the eyes of some people, in the eyes of many people, you've already reached the pinnacle or you are a success. So let me ask you, Jeff, for you, what, what does success look like for you? It's a good question. Uh, I mean, yeah, in, in one sense, I have arrived at being a writer, but I think what I'm trying to do now is become a good writer, become a better writer, maybe someday be a great writer. And, um, you know, something that scares me about the Internet is how um, relatively easy it is to get an audience. Now, I know some people listening to this might think, oh, it's, it's not easy, but it is easy in the sense that, like, how hard – would it be for me to go outside and find five people who wanted to hear what I have to say right now? It would be really hard. Like I would literally have to like go knock on people's doors because we live in a neighborhood and you know, maybe kids are riding their bikes around, but like people aren't, it's not like ancient Greece where like people are walking around the market waiting for great orators to, you know, tell them what they think about the world. We don't live in that kind of culture. Uh, you know, and, but the internet is different. If you have something to say, you can find five people who want to listen. And so the scary thing about that is um, everybody has a megaphone, but who really has anything worth saying? I'm not saying nobody does because certainly people do. Right. But just because I have a megaphone doesn't mean I want to use it all the time. And so um, what I'm trying to appreciate and understand is when do I step up on the platform and speak? 
and when do I listen? Um, and so success for me is, is not just getting more, more followers, more money, more whatever. Um, it's really making an impact because I realize it's, it's easy to just start shouting, you know. It's hard to say something and then see how it affects people. And um, that's, I mean, I know that sounds sort of esoteric, but that's really what I'm interested in. And, you know, that's what success looks like for me is if I can make a big difference on 20, you know, in 20 people's lives, like change 20 people's lives versus get 100,000 more passive followers, I'm going to choose the 20 every time. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks so much, Jeff, for spending some time with us today. And I just want to say to everybody out there, now that you know what success looks like, go out, be bold, be brave, be exceptional, You know, and know that you've got the power to create something new in the world today. Thanks so much, Jeff, for joining us today on What Success Looks Like. I'm Robert Kennedy, and we are out. Mm -hmm.